I thought I would stretch your minds a bit. Um, so that's what uh, we'll be doing in this uh, uh, talk about uh, free will. So disclosures uh, first, uh, nothing is relevant, a lot of irrelevant disclosures. And um, so there'll be occasional slides that'll have blackout. I was told not to put any copyright material, so anything that I thought might be potentially copyrightable, I blacked out, so, or oranged out, or whatever that color is there. So uh, the issue about uh, free will uh, has been discussed a lot lately, and uh, this is actually from uh, an article in the New York Times uh, earlier this, this month, even. Um, who's in charge inside your head? Uh, and uh, people continue to, to talk about it. This has been a topic, of course, for uh, thousands of years, but uh, it uh, is uh, continuing to be an issue that uh, comes up frequently. So volition, what do we mean by volition? Uh, volition, I think the idea there is uh, I choose to move. That would be what uh, people, how people would make an interpretation of the idea of volition or, or free will. And I think that there are two ways of making an interpretation of that. Uh, first, there is some sort of force, a free will force, that aids in the uh, process of movement genesis. And this is certainly what's called the folk psychology view. That is, almost everybody, if you ask them what uh, it's meant by free will, they'd say, well, uh, there's uh, something that's happening, there's this force of choosing that uh, is there, and this is this force that is occurring. Now, one, uh, I think the sort of extreme view is there's a little man inside the head that's doing that. I think most people don't believe in the little man in the head, but the sort of notion that there's some force that's producing the movement is uh, what most people would probably think. And the, uh, the other view of it is that I have the perception that there is such a free will force. And actually, this must be true, because uh, I think people do have that perception that that's the case. So that aspect is the other way of looking at it, but that, that part must be true, uh, of course. And actually, those two are not incompatible with each other. It's possible that, that both are true. But uh, each of them has a substantial problem related to it. And uh, the, the, the problem with force is basically this one. Um, and this is a diagram that was very popular when I was first learning about motor control. Um, uh, Eccles was one of the leaders uh, in motor control physiology. And this was a slide that appeared in almost every textbook and everybody's lecture. And this was the way the brain worked to make movement. And you can see uh, all these things here, planning, programming, executing, all the different parts of the motor system operating. And then there was the idea over here. And uh, there was a broken line between it and everything else. Uh, no one asked a question about this particular diagram. <laughs> how, how could this work? Um, but it turned out that Eccles actually was a dualist. He, uh, he really believed uh, that there was something separate between the mind and the body. And here was the mind, and it was impressing itself on the brain. Uh, but he couldn't quite figure out how it got there. So there was that little break in the diagram. Now, dualism, uh, in its strong form, uh, is that the mind and the body are separate, similar to that particular diagram. And I think that um, most people uh, actually deny this. If you know, thinking about it, you ask, well, is, there, is the mind separate from the brain? People would say, no, it's not true. Um, however, there is a weak form of, of dualism, which I think is sort of implicit in the language that we use. And I'll come back to that a little bit later, because I think that uh, it's really uh, somewhat hard to avoid dualism in at least uh, a weak form. But in the strong form, I think it's probably not, it's, it's not true, at least I think most people wouldn't think it's true, and that's certainly a problem with the notion of a free will force. Now, the problem with perception is consciousness. Uh, perception is something that uh, is an element of consciousness, and uh, consciousness is a real problem because we do not understand it. Uh, philosophers call this the hard problem. Uh, it, is a, it is an extremely difficult problem. Um, 
and i think that we do not understand it we don't even have a conceptual way of understanding it at the moment and so it really becomes undefined at the present time now we operationally define it as awareness i think that's probably the best that uh, people do in terms of understanding what it means consciousness is an awareness how that happens we don't know um, but note that awareness is completely passive uh, it's sort of like a uh, it's like a screen where where we are aware of certain things and uh, it's it's a passive process of, of some kind now there's another term that is valuable to know and that's uh, qualia qualia are the elements of consciousness and uh, free will then uh, uh, in the in the in the perceptual aspect is a quali it's one of those qualia and data about qualia come from introspection and such data can be meaningful it's it's valuable to think about them but those data also can be deceptive and so one has to consider them very thoughtfully and and carefully in terms of what they actually mean now these are the sort of ways in which uh, movement might actually be generated and how free will might might relate to this and the top one is again the sort of folk psychology view that is if you ask anybody how things work this is what they'd say that uh, people decide whether they're going to make a movement or not that that decision in some way impinges on the brain motor mechanisms and a movement comes out that's the way people would say it happens but if you say that the free will is a perception only there are other possible ways that this could work and um, uh, one such way is that the brain makes a movement uh, and then uh, free the uh, quality of free will occurs later or it could be it doesn't have to be serial it could be parallel that is brain motor mechanisms uh, make the movement and they also make free will simultaneously and uh, actually it turns out that uh, all the data uh, that uh, have been able to be accumulated about this subject and it's possible to accumulate a fair amount of information on this all show that uh, this bottom model is the one that seems to be correct yeah. and the top model is not much uh, not much in favor of even though that's the way people might think about it so now I'm going to show you some some data uh, that that bear on this issue and um, uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of data. I'm just going to give you a little bit of, of data. I could actually talk for several hours about this. And I, in this uh, slide deck, I've uh, cut out about 50 slides in the middle here, which uh, with a lot of data. I'm just going to show you a little bit of data that bear on this. I can come back to more data if you want it later. So um, the, uh, what I'm going to uh, show you first is there's a dissociation between movement generation and the sense of volition with movement generation uh, coming first and uh, the other thing I'm going to point out is that volition has two components to it one is uh, willing that is the sense of willing to make a movement and the other uh, aspect of that is uh, agency uh, or in this case self agency and that is that the movement that was just made I was the agent of it. I, I was the one that did the movement that just happened. So I am the agent, self-agency in this case. And willing and agency are separable aspects of, of the sense of volition. And one, it's possible to study uh, both of them. Now, uh, I'm going to tie this occasionally into uh, medicine uh, just a little bit. And this is, this is one of them, because I think that to a certain extent this gives us some information on this. And uh, this is what I call neurological disorders of volition. And the first is one of the major topics of this meeting, that is psychogenic movements. They look voluntary, and actually there's a fair amount of data showing that they use voluntary executive uh, mechanisms of the brain. But the patients say they're involuntary. So it's very interesting, how does a movement that is executed with voluntary mechanisms become recognized as involuntary by the patient? But they're not, that's not the only neurological disorder of volition. Uh, tics, uh, tics are, uh, 
often said by the patient to be voluntary, not necessarily all the time, but much of the time, but the patients say that they cannot not make them, whatever that means. Uh, in Korea, early in the illness, patients don't actually recognize the involuntary movements as being involuntary. They, uh, they have the movement and they're asked about it and they say, well, it's a voluntary movement, I was just scratching my head, something like that. Uh, there's the alien hand phenomenon, where unwanted movements arise without their sense of being willed, and those same patients with that hand have uh, associated difficulty in making self-initiated movement. Schizophrenia is not ordinarily considered a neurological disorder, but it is a disorder of the brain, and there's uh, something fascinating about a lot of their uh, movements because they look normal, they're goal-directed, but if you ask the patient what's happening, he may say that the movements are completely externally controlled, that, that he is not the agent of the movements that are being made. Um, and then there's abulia and akinesia, uh, where there's difficulty in initiating voluntary movements, uh, such as in patients who have Parkinson's disease, for example. And anosognosia, another situation where patients may believe that the movement was made when in fact it wasn't made. So there's all sorts of situations where there's a dissociation here that you can find in neurological patients that have to do with the sense of uh, volition and, and making of movements that we don't understand and I think it's worthwhile to try to understand those. Now the other uh, what I'm going to talk about is one of the basic papers in this field, which probably most of you know, but uh, it is really critical to uh, know about it, and so I'll just make sure everybody knows about it and uh, what, it, what it may mean. This is the relatively famous paper of Benjamin Libet and colleagues published in uh, 1983 in Brain. And what uh, he wanted to do in, in this work is to time the sense of uh, willing to make a movement. Now, uh, prior to uh, this, this paper, it was already known that you could identify in the brain a signal of movement preparation. And this, is, this was called the Bereitschaft potential. Uh, Kornhuber and Dika identified uh, this some, some years before. Um, Bereitschaft potential means readiness potential in, in, in English. Uh, and the movement-related cortical potential, or the MRCP, has a number of components in it that you can look measure with the EEG, the Breitschoff potential being a component of that. So uh, it's a slowly rising negativity in the EEG that precedes movement. So uh, if zero is the onset of movement, in this case, uh, there's a slowly rising negativity here that one can recognize over most of the central part of the brain for a second and a half or so prior to the onset of movement. Uh, it has a number of components in it. This is the BP or the Breitschaft potential. Then there's another component uh, which Shibasaki called NS dash. I think uh, now people are calling this BP1 and BP2, but there's a whole variety of names for these. But nevertheless, it's a phenomenon that is uh, relatively robust. Everybody sees that. Now, what Libet uh, did is to uh, ask people to make voluntary movements while looking at something that looked like this, a clock in uh, which uh, there was this ball that would go around the clock uh, about once every three seconds. And uh, Libet said, just make the movements whenever you want, and uh, then after you make the movement, tell us where the ball was when you decided to make the movement. And that, uh, that's uh, Libet's W, that's willing the time of willing to make the movement. Um, so uh, W, willing to make the movement. He also asked people when the movement actually occurred. That was called M. And then as a test to see how good people were at it, he gave them a little shock to the finger and said, uh, when did you feel the shock? And they do the same thing with the timing. And that was called S. So W, M, and S. And uh, these are the data. Um, so first of all, the beginning of the readiness potential uh, in such movements uh, would be well established. That was already, as I've known for a long time, and usually that was what's called uh, RP1, readiness potential one, here a little more than a second. 
And uh, S was pretty good, as you see there, and M was pretty good uh, uh, within 100 milliseconds of actually happening. And W is here. Uh, this mouse is flickering around quite a bit here. I don't know why it's not very stable. But anyway, there's, there, there is W about um, 300 milliseconds or so before the movement. Um, and uh, Libet pointed out, well, uh, there's the sense of willing 300 milliseconds before the movement, uh, but the readiness potential is uh, way back here at 1,000 milliseconds. So the, the brain is preparing to make the movement before, well before uh, consciousness W. And then he did the experiment again. He said, well, how about if you just make the movement as frivolously as possible? Don't spend any time thinking about it. Just as soon as you have the idea about it, make it right away. Well, that shortened the readiness potential uh, down to 600 milliseconds. But still, it was quite far in advance of W. So the timing of this is that uh, the brain is uh, chugging away, preparing to make the movement. And only relatively late in the course uh, does it bubble up into consciousness. This has recently been, or more recently been, repeated with functional MRI. You can do everything with MRI, too. Uh, by soon and colleagues, they did the same thing with a quite surprising result that they were able to identify activity in the brain eight seconds before the movement. Now, it was only a uh, small probabilistic change. They asked people to move their right hand or their left hand. Uh, but at a 60% probability, of course, 50% is just by chance. But at six, with 60% probability, they were able to determine whether someone was going to move their right or their left hand uh, at eight seconds before the movement occurred. Again, W being around 300 milliseconds or so uh, before it actually happens. So the brain is actually at work long before uh, something is into consciousness itself or long before W is happening. Now, there's another um, interesting um, fact to uh, tell you about, um, and that is that transcranial magnetic stimulation can influence the time of W and M after the movement has actually happened. This is a study by Lau and colleagues in 2007. So they did the Libet experiment, uh, got uh, times of W and M, and then what they did is they did uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, a single pulse, either to the motor cortex or the pre-supplementary motor area at either just at the time the movement happened or 200 milliseconds after the beginning of the movement. And then they asked people, again, when was M and when was W? And what they found was is that uh, no influence stimulating over M1, but with stimulating over the pre-supplementary motor area, there was a change in the uh, way that people reported M and W. Uh, 20 millisecond difference, for example, in the reporting of uh, intention, that's uh, W, um, with the stimulation over the pre-supplementary motor area 200 milliseconds after the movement happened. Now, how can you possibly understand that? Uh, given that M and W are, uh, or at least W, is happening before the, the movement, or it's, it's, it's reported before the movement, but if you give TMS after the movement, people say that the W was at a different time. How can you explain that? Well, it turns out that uh, it's relatively easy to explain because uh, we really live in the past. We do not live in the present. Uh, the subjective present is actually slightly in the real past. Um, now, uh, there's a lot of data that bears on that, but actually it's, it's pretty obvious that that has to be the case. Uh, Say uh, I'm looking at uh, something touching my finger, okay? So there's a real time that that occurs, but the information, uh, the visual information, for example, takes, uh, uh, has to go into the eye, uh, travel through the brain, get to the visual cortex, be interpreted. That takes at least 100, 200 milliseconds or so. Uh, 
the somatosensory information may take uh, 25 milliseconds to show to get into the brain. That has to be interpreted. There are different times, but somehow we think that they're together. So the brain has to put them together in some way. It takes a while to process all that information. And so the idea that we're touched at that particular time, well, that actually happened at least a couple hundred milliseconds before. Has to, has to be, because that takes a while for the information to get there and takes a while for it to process. Now, Libet actually studied uh, this also. This is another one of Libet's things that he studied. And uh, he, he pointed this uh, out, that it takes a while for sensory stimuli to reach awareness uh, he called this the utilization time, and he estimated that it's about 300 or 500 milliseconds uh, with people referring the timing of a stimulus back to when it began, even though it took a while to process it. So, uh, and then I saw this quote from William Faulkner, the past is never dead, it's not even past. I didn't know, he didn't, uh, he, I'm not sure he was referring to this particular phenomenon, but it's, it's actually true, the, the past is actually the present in some, some way, okay. So with that, how do you interpret um, the Libet data, or how is it possible to interpret the Libet data? So um, this, what is happening in a real world, so I've taken that diagram I showed you before and divided it into two parts. The uh, top is real world time, and real world time is uh, the timing of RP1 and RP2 and the EMG onset. Those are real-time events. And then there's the ascribed time of perception on the bottom, uh, the W and the M and the S. Those are ascribed times. But they have to be occurring actually uh, later on. So let's jiggle that axis a bit. And if we jiggle it a couple hundred milliseconds, we find that W and M are actually occurring after the movement. So if you TMS at that point, it's not surprising that you could actually influence the way that they're perceived. Um, they're happening back there, but they are referred forward. That's the way that uh, these things operate. So that's uh, why it would be possible to actually uh, have this somewhat paradoxical result that Lau reported. Okay, so that's a, a bit about uh, willing. I could tell you a lot more about uh, willing uh, if we want to talk about it. And now I will talk a little bit about self-agency. There's a lot of work also going on on the issue of uh, agency and uh, how in the brain that information is being identified. And I'll show you uh, a result of one of our own experiments on, on agency. This is work that uh, Feta Nahab uh, did. <clears throat> I can go into details, but I just, uh, uh, in this particular experiment, what we did is we asked people to make movements uh, of which they had a variable amount of control, uh, and they could see what was happening. So they were making movements of their hand, and they were looking at something, and at some of the points they were in full control, other times they had no control, and then there were intermediate levels of control. And behaviorally, this is what was uh, seen in that situation. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, amount of control they actually had, and this is how much they thought they had. So people did pretty well. When they were fully in control, that is, they had a full sense of self-agency, they thought that they were fully in control. When they actually had no control at all, they were pretty close to the fact that they recognized that they didn't have control. And in the intermediate levels, they didn't do too badly as well. So it was a pretty good, pretty good relationship. Now, we could look at the brain activity uh, parametrically uh, related to the amount of self-control or the self-agency identified. And that's what this picture is. Um, so these are the regions of the brain responding proportionally uh, to the loss of self-agency. So this is actually an inverse relationship. I can talk about that too if you'd like a little bit later. But uh, the, there's a number of areas, but the one that I'd like to draw your attention to uh, is the uh, temporoparietal junction region. That is the, seems to be the most active area in the brain uh, relating to the sense of self-agency. Other areas as well but uh, that's the one that is the, the most active. And other people have seen uh, 
similar things. So this particular region has been identified in a number of different studies. Now, tell you uh, a little bit about our work in psychogenic movement disorders. As I pointed out, uh, patients, one of the things that's fascinating about patients with psychogenic movement disorders is that they don't have a sense of volition for their movements. Their movements happen, but they don't have a sense of volition. And uh, Valerie Voon uh, did a study where we looked at uh, individuals who had psychogenic tremor, who could also mimic their tremor, and we compared uh, their uh, psychogenic tremor to their voluntary tremor. It looked the same. The only difference was that in one case they had volition for it, in the other case they didn't have volition for it. What, when we could look at the brain activity that was different, and the spot that was uh, hypoactive in the conversion tremor compared to the voluntarily mimicked tremor was the right temporoparietal junction, act, uh, which is the same spot that I just pointed out earlier has something to do with agency. So we have uh, thought that it is conceivable that the patients with psychogenic movement disorders don't have uh, a sense of volition in part because of this uh, abnormality uh, of activity in the uh, temporoparietal junction region. Now, um, actually, um, much of what goes on in the brain is unconscious. Uh, only a small amount of it is, is, in, con uh, is in consciousness. Um, this was a paper that was published in Science. Of course, I mean, people have known this for a long time, but uh, I don't, you wonder how this got into science. I was a bit surprised about that. But it's not actually a new article. It's sort of a review article. Um, but nevertheless, uh, there's still the people are constantly reminded that there's the unconscious uh, will. Let me just tell you about a couple of things that sort of prove the unconscious will aspect. This is what I call the salted peanut problem. Um, you're, you're, you're sitting in front of a bowl of salted peanuts and you have a number of salted peanuts and uh, at some point you say to yourself, I've had enough, I don't want any more salted peanuts. You sit there and within 15 seconds your hand is going out, <laughs> going for the salted peanuts. Uh, the question is who's in charge at that point. Uh, here's, a, here's a very interesting, you, you, you've probably heard about this, uh, paper that was published in PNAS in, uh, uh, a little more than a year ago. Um, this is a report of um, uh, what's happened in the Israeli judicial system uh, granting uh, parole to prisoners. Uh, these, these judges uh, saw people all day long and uh, this is by ordinal position of the prisoners that they saw on that particular day and uh, this circle has, is, was breakfast, this was lunch, and this was afternoon snack. Uh, now, the, the judges thought that they were being equal in their judgments all day long, but if they had a full stomach, they were much more likely to grant parole to the uh, prisoners than if they were hungry. Um, so this, uh, again, shows uh, unconscious uh, aspects, uh, just whether someone is uh, full or not uh, uh, in terms of uh, granting parole. And then there's the issue of placebo and nocebo, uh, the role of belief. Uh, if you tell people that they're getting a pill that might work, they, they'll get better. If you give people a pill and tell them it's going to make them worse, then they get worse. Um, so I, I think that uh, even though it's, in, it's, it's inert, so that uh, if people believe something is going to happen, that will perhaps cause it to happen in part. All right, so let's go back to uh, dualism. Uh, I've already talked about the strong form. Now I'm going to talk about the weak form, uh, which I think is uh, implicit in our language and uh, some ways confuse us. Um, so you'll hear things, particularly talking about the Libet experiment and those other ones, your brain knows before you do that you will be making the movement. Or you don't have free will if your brain is doing it, not you. All right? So those are things that people often say when they uh, discuss the Libet experiment. But it doesn't make any sense. It, uh, in my mind, that's uh, this implicit dualism. 
uh, because you are your brain. To say that you and your brain know something at different times doesn't really make sense. Um, so uh, how can you interpret what's actually happening? The brain is doing many things simultaneously. Most of them are actually unconscious, and only occasionally will something bubble up into consciousness. And it's important to uh, not talk about you and your brain as being separate things. You are your brain. So what's the interpretation then of, of free will? Is the brain, so the question then is not whether, uh, you might phrase it a slightly different way, it's not whether you are free to choose what to do. You might, there's no need to worry about consciousness in this. You can just say, is the brain free to choose what to do? And ordinarily, brains appear to do that. Brains uh, are choosing what to do. And how do they choose what to do? They choose what to do because of reward, emotion, homeostatic drive, sensation, cognition, past experience, planning, all those factors. Some, probabilistically, we're talking about nudge yesterday. There's nudges here, too. Uh, on the motor system, and all those things eventually probabilistically decide what the motor system does. Uh, reward comes from the dopaminergic system, emotion from the limbic system, homeostatic drive from the hypothalamus, sensation from the posterior half of the cortex, and this is all coming from the frontal lobe. All those factors impinge. The whole brain feeds into the motor system, and probabilistically something comes out. So uh, what is, is there a line between free and not free in terms of what uh, people might do? Well, if the brain is having a seizure and there's a resulting behavior as a result of that, you wouldn't necessarily say that that's freely chosen by the brain. That's something that seems to be uh, enforced upon the brain somehow, and uh, so that's, that's not free will. Maybe. So if you have a gun to your head or you're being tortured and then you do something as a consequence of that, is that free or, or not free uh, at that point? I think most people would say that that's not necessarily free will. The brain is perhaps being externally controlled in that case. So how about if you're under the influence of drugs or addicted it's going to get more and more difficult to go, <laughs> go down here. How about if you're in a hypnotic state? Uh, how about if you're just brainwashed by, by terrorists? Or how about if you're just brainwashed in school to believe in a certain way? Is that uh, free or, or not free? I don't know. You have to decide about that. All right, so think about that. That's something to think about. Um, so this is that um, diagram that I showed you in the beginning about uh, what have all the data seem to show this particular thing, that there's the brain mechanisms making the movement and the perception. How does that map onto anatomy? There's a lot of data that bear on this. So that uh, what's happening is all those mechanisms that I was talking about before, those prefrontal mechanisms and so on, um, help decide what someone's going to do at any one time. Then it goes to the pre-supplementary motor area uh, and the dorsolateral prefrontal area and, and so on. And they go to the motor cortex that makes the movement. At the same time, there's corollary discharge uh, or feed forward signals that come to the uh, various parts of the brain but include the uh, temporoparietal junction. Then the movement happens and you get feedback from that into the same area. The feed-forward signal helps create the sense of willing. The feedback signal helps create the sense of self-agency. And um, all those signals are helping to inform consciousness or create in consciousness these different uh, sensations. So we're beginning to have some sense about how the system operates. All right, so does, does free will exist um, after what I've uh, just told you? Well. Here was an advertisement I saw once. Uh, when, uh, so this is a free will. When one spouse has a will prepared for the regular fee, there'll be no charge for the second will for the other spouse. But that expired in 1993, so. 
so no more no more chance for a free will. And then uh, <laughs> I was uh, on vacation this year. I saw this particular store. <laughs> I don't know how you pronounce that, but I suppose that's also free will. Uh, so there is free will that you can go and buy at this store. Uh, so does does free will exist? So it depends upon definitions, I think. So uh, I I think that uh, it doesn't uh, exist if you uh, are a dualist and you think that the, the mind is creating it. I don't think that, uh, that that is the case. I don't think there's dualism and I don't think that that would be correct. However, it's possible to say yes if uh, the person's brain is choosing what to do, that the brain is inter in internally determined, not externally commanded in some way to perform an action, and the, the quality of agency is created. So if the brain is uh, choosing what to do and the sense of uh, agency is created, then I think that that is in fact what we mean. That would be a, a, a modern interpretation, I think, of what free will is, and I think that it exists in that form. So um, final word here about responsibility. What does this now mean for responsibility, given that uh, given that's the case? So there's another uh, blank part. But any event, so I want to talk first about uh, an interesting analogy that I heard about the other day. These are the self-driving cars that are now legal in California. You know that Google has been working on these uh, self-driving cars that uh, you sit in the car and you turn it on and it drives normally uh, through the streets and whatnot. And apparently it's very safe. Uh, they've, been, they've, been, they've been tested a lot. They, they, they don't make any mistakes and they do very well. However, uh, who's to blame when the robotic car crashes? Now, uh, you're, you're sitting in the car and the car is driving along and it then crashes into something else. So who's responsible for that? Uh, are, are you responsible? You're, you're sitting in the car. Uh, uh, you're sitting in the driver's seat of the car. Uh, is it the car manufacturer? Uh, is it the software engineer? Um, who's responsible for, uh, for that? Um, that may be an interesting analogy in some ways to uh, responsibility uh, of individual people, but I'll, I'm not going to answer these questions. I'm just raising <laughs> raising questions. Actually, there was a blog that I saw after this where most people said, oh, this isn't an issue, it's just the insurance company will pay. You know. <laughs> but I'm not sure that that's the, uh, a full, satisfactory, philosophical answer to this question. All right, so I think that brains are always responsible uh, for the attached body's behavior. So there's always this question, is, a, is, is the person responsible for what they've done, I think that brains are always responsible. And the relevant question in my mind is why did the brain choose that particular behavior? And uh, once you decide that, then that should guide reward, punishment, treatment, further education, and so on. And I think that that would be the way to be uh, helpful, not necessarily to try to decide whether the person was responsible or not. I think the, the person's brain is always responsible for the behavior that's, that's occurring. So one example, Jean Valjean, the famous guy here, um, he, uh, in poverty, he stole a loaf of bread to feed his starving sister and her seven children. He uh, served 19 years in prison and then was branded as a criminal. He behaved as a criminal until a Bishop Muriel of Digne taught him a lesson and he became an honorable man thereafter. So uh, issues about this, would there be less crime if there were less poverty? Uh, yes, uh, he is responsible, but is the best consequence for him incarceration? Would, would that have, is that really the best thing to have done for him in this particular circumstance, even though he was responsible for, for doing that? Was, the penish was this punishment not only the best for, uh, for him, or worse for him, but is it the best for society? Uh, was that the best thing to have done for him or uh, for, for society in that particular uh, case? Uh, would education uh, 
uh, be a better punishment than incarceration uh, for him in that particular circumstance. So there are a variety of issues that uh, come up dealing with responsibility as a result of this particular view of uh, free will. So I've raised a number of uh, issues, uh, not all of which I've answered, and I now leave it to you to discuss all these issues. Thank you very much. Right, right more than left. Uh, it is, in fact, bilateral, but the right is more than the left. In, uh, believe me, it's, it's the right that's more than the left uh, in both cases. But uh, it, is, it, is, it is, to a certain extent, bilateral, but the right side does seem to be more than the left side. No, no, actually... Uh, uh, I think I, what I said was is that uh, most patients with tick will say that they are voluntarily doing the movement. Uh, but they, they can, so what a, what a good analogy is is a strong itch. Uh, if you have an itch, uh, at some point you have an extremely difficult time not scratching it. Uh, you, you have this feeling that you really have to scratch that itch. And uh, so that, that, I think, is a, is a good analogy to what's happening in tick. They, they get a strong urge that they cannot, uh, e eventually, they cannot hold it back anymore, and they have to do it. Or if you, if you try not to blink, if you try to keep your eyes open and not blink, it's the same thing. The urge gets stronger and stronger and stronger, and finally you blink. Uh, and you blink voluntarily to a certain extent, but it, the urge, it just becomes so strong that you can't not do it anymore. Yeah. So, so you're saying that it's not all. I mean, we're not talking about the person somewhere else. The one who needs to do something that's useful for not. What you're talking about is overwhelming stimuli that you lose the ability to do something voluntary about the person. So, so what, what I'm hearing from your talk um, about this is like, Yeah, well, I, I think what, what's happened is the probability just gets stronger and stronger of that particular choice of, of happening. There's a lot of, again, at any one time you can do a variety of things, but because that urge gets stronger and stronger, the, probab the probability for the brain to do that gets higher and higher. Again, the sort of consciousness element of it uh, comes later on. The brain does it because that factor gets to be more and more powerful. Uh, most of the time, most of the time for most of us, including patients who are ticking, they're not, we're not thinking about whether our movements are voluntary or not. That's not anything that we're concentrating on. If you concentrate on it, you're asked, is it voluntary? So most of the time, if you ask a patient with Tourette's, are their movements voluntary or not, they don't even know. They don't even think about it. It's not an issue. But if you force them to think about it, they'll say, well, all right, well, maybe it is voluntary. Uh, but it's, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a practical consideration. So I think that the way to think about it is, uh, is the way to think about movement in general, what I was trying to, trying to convince you of, is that uh, the brain just goes along, chugging along its way. Most of the things are below the surface. And those things just happen. And the urge gets stronger and stronger. And you could 
Okay, so one could argue, is that free will or not in that particular circumstance? And, uh, well, I don't know. You, it, this, is a, this is a tricky business, but people will say, if you force them, most patients with Tourette's will say, yes, it's voluntary in the end. But I think that the behavior, as opposed to the question about whether it's voluntary or not, the behavior is very easy to understand, really. This urge gets stronger and stronger, and finally the brain does it. That's all there's to it, except that there's an interpretation somewhere the brain cognitively tries to put something on its consciousness and quality and figure it out. Paul. So, uh, I, I, so, I mean, those are good questions, and I'm not sure I have an absolute answer to it. Uh, I think that I would, I think that perhaps what I would do is perhaps slightly different from the way you're thinking about it, is that I don't necessarily separate unconscious drives and conscious drives, uh, that they're all important, uh, and they're all driving the brain to do certain things. There are probably more unconscious elements than there are conscious elements driving behavior at any one time. So to weight what's in consciousness more than what's unconscious uh, may not be right. And I guess that's what I'm arguing for, that the unconscious elements are just as important as the conscious elements. Uh, just a small amount of what is happening in the brain is actually conscious. In relation to responsibility, I'm not sure I have a final answer. Uh, I, I think I just raised more questions than that. I hope I gave you answers there. Are there those are things to think about. Uh, in terms of how you use the information that has been developed to develop a theory of uh, actual responsibility. I'm, I'm uh, a neurologist and a neuroscientist. I'm not a philosopher or anything else and, or a judge. Or, so, I'll, I'll let, uh, so I'm raising questions about responsibility in terms of what the data might, might mean. Uh, in terms of uh, interpreting whether there is free will or not, or what is the, na I'm, I think that I'm trying to do is to take the data that we have and to try to understand what the notion of free will might mean. And I think that uh, there's a real uh, problem in terms of trying to define what that actually means. And I, what I'm trying to do is to use the data to come to a better definition of what that term uh, is, is meaning and how one can think about it. And the way that, uh, and I think that I've showed you that it's possible to get a great deal of data that bear on that issue. Now, I haven't shown you all the, the data that there are, but using that particular model, you can develop an enormous amount of data of how the brain creates the sense of willing, how the brain creates the sense of agency, what those different processes are, and uh, using that as a framework, one can then learn more about how the brain works. Uh, assigning responsibility to the brain in the end, uh, well, that's something that we have to figure out. I, I don't get it yet. Uh -huh.